Hi, my name is Harris. I'm one of your podcast hosts. I'm also a lawyer at Treadstone Law. For most Canadians buying, selling, or refinancing real estate, a lawyer is the last thing on their mind. That's unfortunate because lawyers play a vital role in the process. But what choices do Canadians have? Lawyers can be very expensive. Well, Treadstone Law offers resources to Canadians so they have access to the information they need. Whether you sign up for a live workshop or a mailing list, we cover topics to help you make informed decisions and avoid costly mistakes. It's advice you can start using today, and best of all, it's free. Visit treadstonelaw.ca forward slash MAS offer or click the link below to get access right now. If you're looking to retain Treadstone Law, it's never been easier. Our entire process is online. From completing the retainer agreement to your signing appointment, everything is done from the comfort of your own home. We're your digital lawyers. The best part of it is that you don't pay anything when you're retaining our firm. Visit treadstonelaw.ca forward slash MAS offer or click on the link below to retain us right now. Enjoy the podcast. Welcome to another episode of Hustle and Grit. Today on my podcast, I've got a special guest, Roy Cocciola. Roy is the president and CEO of Your Mortgage Your Way. Roy's vision is to put clients' needs first to provide great service and comprehensive advice. Together, he can create a mortgage plan that meets your financial goals. His objective is to assist you in making a sound financial decision on making your debt and creating wealth. A mortgage shouldn't hinder your financial goals. Really, it should complement them. Welcome to the podcast, Roy. Thank you very much. I appreciate you having me here today. It's, it's amazing to have you. I mean, um, it's not every day that we have people um, that have kind of really climbed to some of the highest ranks in the mortgage industry. And to just kick things off, why don't you kind of walk our listeners to how you got to be the president of C- and CEO of Your Mortgage Your Way? Was, was the mortgage industry something that you always wanted or was it something that you fell in um what was it that kind of got you into the industry (laughs) well the truth of it is i kind of fell into it by accident i actually worked overseas as a sales manager for a direct marketing company for four years i actually lived and worked in asia um for that time and then when i moved back to canada i didn't know what i wanted to do Uh, i didn't know if i want to sell cars i didn't know if i want to get into real estate or whatever and uh, my brother was working at CIBC at the time and introduced me to a couple of colleagues at a uh, event at Woodbine uh, Racetrack. And they said, well, if you want to be a mortgage specialist, we have space for you if you want. And I'm like, sure, I'll try it. Um, so I took a year at CIBC um, and uh, that was a heck of a grind for me because I didn't really understand the industry at the time. Uh, but I got a lot of great training. Uh, and then I actually got hired by uh, Canada Trust at the time. Uh, this is a while back before mm. we became TD Canada Trust. Uh, and mm. then all of a sudden they had a hiring mm. freeze. So I was stuck between being BC, like I was stuck between the like CIBC and TD. I, I left CIBC and I couldn't do anything with TD Canada Trust. And I had all these deals come in. So a friend of mine that I knew was actually a mortgage broker. So I would feed my deals off to him. He says, why don't you just come meet my boss? And uh, I met his boss, Don Stoddard at the time. And uh, I, uh, I I became a mortgage broker all of a sudden at uh, at back then it was first provincial. But that's not an easy move though. That's not an easy move going from a bank and then because a bank, at least from the outside world, it's it's a cushy job. It's 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 nice. It's reputable. And then kind of going to basically being self-employed, it's it's a decent jump. It, it was, but um, you know, being a, a mortgage agent at the bank was mostly commission anyway. Um, so it was like being self-employed, mm. but they did some great training and stuff. And I just, I'm not a really big corporate guy. I don't like corporate politics. Mm. If I want change, I like to make my own changes. Um, so mm. from there I left, uh, well, I didn't really leave. Um, then they all amalgamated into one company, first provincial Norlight, a bunch of other ones became mortgage intelligence. And I was there okay. for about a year. And then we started our own company called assured mortgages. Uh, and then from there, I was actually managing partner and uh, at Monster Mortgage for nine years. And then I, uh, I, I opened up Your Mortgage way back in March of 2014 uh, on my own. And now we are a small niche 
of 26 agents at Your Mortgage Away uh, down in Toronto. Uh, and last year we did uh, just shy of $1 billion in originations. Um, so we are we are like a small little niche company that does really, really well. I have excellent agents. Uh, we mm-hmm. were ranked in Canada for the highest average per agent um, um, production. So yeah. I'm really proud of that. Oh, that's, so, that's, a, that's a big accolade. So when you say niche, what do you mean by niche? Is there like a, a certain type of mortgages that you deal with? Like when you, can you kind of describe that a little bit more? Well, we, we mostly do residential, like most mortgage brokerage. We do some commercial industrial stuff. Mm-hmm. We do construction loans. Um, and then what I mean is a niche is we're really like more of a family oriented little brokerage. We're not looking mm-hmm. to expand to get to 200 or 300 agents. It's not our, it's not really our, our, our core values. What we want to be able to do for our agents is teach them to become super successful. Um, yeah. and, and that's what we want to do. We don't, we're not looking, I don't, I don't want to manage 200 guys It's too much. And if you're not producing, then I don't really need a name on my roster roster. What I like to do is hire very good professionals who understand the industry, who understand the mortgage products or young guns who are getting into the business, who have lots of great sales ability, but no real mentorship. Those are the kind of people we like to get aboard with uh, your mortgage away uh, and help them get to the next level uh, on that side. So, yes, yeah, so you- yeah. So when you're saying niche, it's more about like culture. It's not necessarily about the mortgages. It's about the type of organizational culture that you have with your team. Um, so what, uh, when it comes down to, I guess, uh, uh, your culture and, and, your, and, your, and, and the type of um, team building that you do, um, one thing actually just off the top of my head, and I know I'm segueing a little bit here, but the reason actually whenever somebody comes down to me and they ask me like, you know what, I need a mortgage, should I go to a mortgage broker or a bank? I love banks, right? Uh, and, and we do tons of business with banks. But the reason I always suggest mortgage broker is exactly kind of what you've stated, where it's like, you know what, if a mortgage broker is really good at their job, they're going to be there 10 years from now, and you can actually go through your entire life with them, and they can understand who you are and what your needs are. Um, going from your first home to your rental property to investment to vacation home, you need a, a credit line for your kids going off to college, like whatever you need, right? If you're a good mortgage broker, you're going to be there 10 years. At the bank, if you're really good, you're going to be gone in two years because you're going to get promoted and it's a new face every single time. Yep. I get that call, Thomas, and I had this great guy at the bank and now he got promoted and I don't know who this person is and 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 that is true for us. If I mean, like, if you pick up the phone, my clients call me. They don't call a call center. They don't call a branch. They call me directly. And uh, we have a great underwriting team uh, that we deal with as well. So they're always well taken care of, and and we walk them through the process. And uh, we are like, I think that during a pandemic, and one thing the pandemic mm-hmm. truly destroyed in any major market is customer service. Yeah. And uh, I have to say that. That's why I think mortgage brokers did really well over over COVID is because whether or not our service from the bank side is a little bit slower than normally it was, they had somebody they can call and talk to. Right. Right? And we're like, we hold their hand and say, I understand you're in a hurry and understand things. And we, we kept in touch with them. So I think that's something that um, that we 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 did really well during COVID. And that's why I think the broker picked up a big market share during COVID uh, for mortgages because of customer service. Yeah, and also it's just that I feel like, uh, I mean, banks, because it's a bigger organization, and I don't hate banks. I love banks. I'm not saying anything against them. But there's just, yeah, <laughs> there's just drawbacks, right? So, like, going into a, a specialist who, first of all, may be younger than two years in the industry and may not have gotten the same kind of training um, that somebody in a brokerage would. And when I say that, it's because when you go to a good broker – and a good brokerage, right? Like you're training your guys. So you're, you're letting them know this is how you can place different deals. Whereas I don't think in the bigger banks, you're only kind of given a script on the products that they have and then that's it. And so you, sometimes you don't even know those products well enough because you're not only selling mortgage, you're selling whatever it is, your, your uh, mutual funds, you're selling uh, bank accounts, visa cards, whatever it is. And so to specialize is extremely difficult. And it's not even just to say that these individuals are, are lacking in any kind of intellectual way. It's just that there's a lot of stuff thrown at them at the bank. 
and a mortgage is no longer a mortgage, right? There's no way, I mean, there is gone as a day where like 10, 15, 20 years ago when a mortgage is a mortgage. Now, like, there's just so many different things that you really have to specialize in it and it has to be your craft and you have to be dedicated to it for a number of years um, to in, in order to really kind of be, give meaningful advice. Yeah, and I think what the problem with banks is when they, they're jack of all trades, you're selling bank accounts, you're selling credit cards, you're selling life insurance, you're selling this, that, the other thing. And when it comes down to the mortgage itself, like it's a loss leader for most banks. There's not a huge profit margin in mortgages for banks. Mm. So for them, it just gets you in the door with a mortgage and then sell you everything else in behind it, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sell you a bank account and cut, you know, service fees and all that kind of other stuff that they want you to have, high interest rate credit cards. Um, and one thing we look at too is just the fact when you come into us and and we want to to see what the best i you know best situation is for you and a lot of people have a lot what we call debt equity and debt equity is just a lot of money tied up in your house that you're not doing anything mm. with right and you can use that and leverage it so that way you can create wealth for the future i mean if you're you know in in your mid forties and you have a house that's worth now say a million four and you have a three hundred thousand dollar mortgage you should look at leveraging some of that and putting it into the market so that way you still got to have 20 years to work so you're going to pay off your house anyway and you mm. might as well have something to create wealth on the other side so that way when you retire you're not just based on Canadian pension plan and just the value of your house. Mm. You want to leverage some of that to have other means of income whether you buy dividend paying stocks or rental uh, property. Something you know, with cash other, flow. Yeah, bonds, whatever it is that, that, yeah. that, that you like to invest in outside so people forget that when you buy a house it should be actually a tool to create wealth not just a place for you to live at hmm. because i think it was 76 yeah, percent yeah. net worth is in real estate and it, it's principal residence so you have to leverage that so that's not so high really to yeah. be honest with you because yeah. you have to diversify yeah. no, i think a lot of people kind of mistake your house for uh, being this crazy asset that they can kind of milk forever when it really is just a, a strategic investment that if you leverage the right way, you can get into other places and actually increase your wealth overall. So 100% agree. But kind of going back to um, your mo your brokerage, can you walk us through kind of the experience of what it's like working with your brokerage? I know you kind of touched upon it that people could call you. Um, are you guys all uh, remote um is there an office um is all the signings remote like what is it like because i know that um some some brokers have to see people in person some of them are only digital so like where where what's your kind of customer experience so we we uh so if, if we get a client we always have a touch point where there's a phone call to discuss what options mm -hmm. you're looking for on that side um, and then what we do is we do have a secured um, application that we send them a link for that they can actually fill all their information securely. They can upload all their documents in one place. Uh, so that way we're not bumbling around with emails and going back and forth and things like that. Um, and then we'll, we'll put the deal together for them and then call them back with all the options that are available to them mm -hmm. and then submit it down to, to, to the lending institutions. And we can do this like virtually mostly. And, and COVID taught us one thing that I don't have to see every client. Uh, we mm. set up Zoom calls, we set up uh, Google Meets, we've done things over DocuSign. So a lot of stuff for us is digital, but we do talk to the client on the phone. It's not like you just send an application, some yeah. random person will get up and send it off to you. But we always tend to have that initial meeting, find out what their what their goals are, right? Whether it's a first-time buyer, um, like today I have a meeting with somebody who's looking to refinance their condo to purchase a house. They want to keep their, 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 uh, their existing asset. Um, so then we'll go through all their options at the mall. Okay, if you want to buy X house and you keep your condo, this is what you qualify for a purchase. And if you sell a condo, this is what you qualify for a purchase. And, and, and we just go through that with them and say, hey, listen, maybe you, it's a good idea to keep your condo. Maybe it's not. So we just go through all their options so they understand where they can maximize uh, their their equity to make sure they can maximize their wealth uh, coming down the pipeline uh, for retirement. Um, and most of us forget that there's more than one way to get in the real estate market, especially for the um, first time buyers. Yeah. So, I mean, um, one of the things that I kind of found um, through this entire, and you're kind of touching upon it, um, during the COVID experience, there was a lot of bad, but some of the good stuff was, 
like being able to talk to a professional almost face to face, kind of like what we're doing right now, right? Um, but yeah. you're sitting at your own home. It's something that I feel like it's it's easier. I, I, correct me if I'm wrong. It frees up time for in your day to give actually talk to more people and give them more advice, and people can actually talk to you. And see your face, whether it's through Zoom and Teams, because I'm a still big believer of like just seeing somebody's face, getting to know them instead of a voice over over the phone, um, to actually kind of do not just business, but to to better understand who you are. Um, didn't kind of COVID help you guys in terms of um, giving that advice to more people in less time? Oh, 100 percent. The efficiency levels for us when COVID hit, like we're always, people don't like change, right? I, yeah. I was one of those, I met 95% of my clients. Like everybody came into my office or I stopped by their home or whatever it was. But, you know, you're taking two hours, three hours of your day driving to one yeah. place, have an hour meeting with somebody and then drive to the next place. Uh, and this one here, like I remember sometimes I had so much spare time because I would just have a Zoom call with somebody. We're done in 15 minutes right? Or 30 minutes or however long the conversation is. And then it's like, I got the application and beforehand, like you walk around with stacks of paper, bring it back to the office and put stuff. And this is way more efficient, which actually benefited clients because I'm not as tired at the end of the day. So if you, yeah. if you have a three o'clock or two o'clock afternoon appointment with me, you probably get a different version of me than yeah. at five thirty o'clock, <laughs> you know, after, after a long day of work, and you're sitting there and you're waiting and, and, uh, and they're, they're tired from work. So I think that mm -hmm. it definitely created a much better connection in the sense that you're never in a rush. Yeah. You actually have time. Like really like, and, and the beauty is like you have nothing really else to do besides either you're at the office and I was lucky because in COVID there's nobody in my office by myself. So mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time at the office uh, or you're at home. There's no, there's no two ends that's about it. So, you had no excuse to say, well, I'm too busy or I can't really make it tonight or I don't feel like it. It's like, hey, you need a Zoom call at 7 o'clock at night? Yeah. Hey, no problem. Here's the invite. I'll talk to you at 7. And uh, that was a great eye-opener for us. And we just keep that going. And, and, and clients also enjoy it because they don't have to travel to you. Yeah. Right? And you don't have to travel to them. So everybody kind of enjoys the fact that it's quick, it's easy, and it's simplified and I'm I'm so glad we have this technology. I'm not sure we would have done if this happened 19. Yeah, <laughs> everything would close down. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we said fax, fax the Equifax yeah. uh, to Equifax to get back a credit bureau. Like it was, it was, it was actually quite ridiculous. I mean, I think the legal industry, this is totally off topic, but legal industry in a lot of ways is still like that. They're, behind the scenes, people are still faxing one another. And I'm like, you know, there's email, but some lawyers that just don't want to get away from the facts, which is, I'm not going to say it's wrong. I'm not allowed to say it's wrong, but it is definitely inconvenient. <laughs> but yeah. Well, the facts here to an email nowadays? Yeah, so our, 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 all of our systems, whenever a fax comes in, because we get faxes all the time, even the bank's fax, right? So it all converts it into uh, an email, and then because they want faxes back often enough with mortgages and whatever yeah. it is, so our email will convert it into a fax and send it back. But if they don't want to email, they don't want to email. There's nothing we can do about it. Um, well, this, this is how long I've been in the industry, okay? I know it doesn't look like it. But when I used to be in the industry, they would fax offers back and forth on that, that thermal rolly paper. Oh, damn. And if you yeah. sign it back more than 10 times, you could never read it anymore, right? Oh, so we yeah. always had to get the original along <laughs> with this. And if it's the end of the fax paper, it'd be all curled up. And you have to yeah, sit there and yeah. try to squeeze it yeah. out. It was actually quite funny that we used to have to do that. But nowadays, you know what? It's just DocuSign saves everything. It's just like it's beautiful. You get it is. Offer, uh, clean, yeah. Yeah. And then, and then when, like you're saying, like you, you can actually read <laughs> the document after a few edits. <laughs> it's like, it looks pretty nice, yep. but yep. yeah, I want, I want to, I want to change, I want to change gears a little bit just because, sure. um, the market's just like insane. I feel like, um, I, I personally beginning of this year did not think we were going to see this many interest rate hikes. Um, and I did not think we'd be in the situation we are today. And I, I really don't, I can't say, I have like an understanding of where we're going in the future, but to kick things off, this is going to be, I want to know, I guess your opinion before I ask you about anything else, are you still um, recommending variable or fixed rates to any client coming in? 
Um, the funny thing is I'm a big variable rate guy. I've been a variable rate guy my whole entire life. I've never, we never expected them to raise rates as much as they have uh, yeah. now either. Um, I think that uh, the inflationary factors they miscalculated, they had, they should have nipped this in the butt back in October of 2021, to be honest with you, yeah. uh, when inflation was sliding about 4%. And they were like, oh yeah, it's just transient. It'll be fine. Yeah. But now they're saying it might be embedded inflation, which is a different story altogether. Uh, but what's happening is, don't forget that inflation, if you look at March of 2021, when everything was shut down, so there's no inflation, and then March of 2022, when things are happening, people are buying stuff, of course there's going to be inflationary factors. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, Bank of Can made it very clear that their mandate is to control inflation. They don't care about the recession coming. They don't care about anything. They just want to get this inflationary factor back in order. So... For me right now, what I'm recommending for most of my clients is a short-term mortgage, more like a one-year, maybe two, depending on the pricing of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and simply because it's cheaper than the variable rate. It's And don't forget, people forget one thing. All mortgages in Canada are variable. The only difference mm -hmm. is how often do they change your interest rate. For example, if I have a one-year fixed, it's variable because every year my, my rate could change. Yeah. To five year, my, my, my rate will change every five years. Mm -hmm. So people forget about that portion of it. But when it comes down to what's happening now, do we foresee more interest rate hikes? I'm going to say they're going to have two more, one medium sized one, maybe 50 basis points in October, and then maybe a 25 basis point one in December, and then they'll just wait and see what happens. Job markets are starting to slow down. We're not creating as many jobs as we used to. Inflation is starting to slow down. So I think it might be, you know, uh, kind of a, uh, let's get this over with, overshoot by a, a lot, and mm -hmm. let's see what happens, okay? Um, we're at the end of this now, I think. We're pretty close to the end of it. Um, so to lock into a five-year fixed rate might be a mistake because five years, if you're not insurable, are going to be in the mid-fives. Um, and for you to lock in that rate for the next five years, in I think in 18 months, you'll be really mad at yourself for locking in that long. Yeah. So right now, my thing is more if you want to get a fixed rate, take some that's short term, one, maybe two years max. Um, when I think inflation will stabilize in 2023 and in 2024 is presidential election year, yeah. and historically rates most of that time. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I have a feeling that they're going to try to bring the interest rates down um, just simply because of the, a lot of our directions coming from this, uh, our neighbor down south and and they refuse to acknowledge that they're in a recession so even though technically as far as uh, as time as forever um, if you your economy is contracted two quarters in a row you're in a recession but this time they're saying no um, and it's, I guess they want they don't want a reason not to keep increasing the rates. But yeah, like you're saying, I do feel like before the elections come about, they're going to bring it down. So everybody's kind of flush with cash, but not flush with cash, but they're, they're, the affordability kind of goes up. So my question then, are you saying that definitely you want like a, a short term two year mortgage, but are you moving towards a variable or a fixed for the two years? Well, the two years will be a fixed rate mortgage because they don't really have two year variable rates. Okay. Um, so variable rate typically is five years. And depending on the lender, some, some lenders um, will allow you to get out three years, after three years completely open. And some lenders do have that uh, static payment, right? So okay. that way your payments won't change. And being at the top end of the interest rate cycle is beneficial because if rates go down, you'll be paying your mortgage a lot faster off, right? Yeah. That, that's that's yeah. the advantage of that side. Um, but for us, they already... The bank had already said that even if inflation goes back down the right way, that they're going to keep rates where they are for at least 12 months just to make sure inflation's out of the system. So if that's the case, I'm going to say it's going to be a really rough ride for most people on mm. that side. But everyone's already qualified five and a quarter. And most of the people that took a variable rate are going to be around the five and a quarter by the time this is all ended anyway. Yeah. So. It just hurts a little bit for sure. Like I'm in a variable rate mortgage. My mortgage payment's gone up about two thousand dollars since oh, wow. I started. Yeah. Right. And I never thought they were going to do this fast, and they, this quickly. And the truth of it is, they did this kind of backwards, Harris. They they should have gone in March like a one percent interest rate hike, a one percent interest rate hike, 
and then slowly add the other ones. Yeah. But they knew they messed up. Like January, we should have had one, but because there's another lockdown, they decide, okay, we're gonna wait. Yeah. Now we're we're paying the price on that side, and Bank of Canada did drop the ball. But remember, the Bank of Canada printed two six hundred billion dollars yeah. in. In in, in 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 basically emergency cash to help people out. That's got to come out somewhere, yeah. right? It's not like they picked and choose people. Okay, yeah, you're not working, so here's some money. They gave it to everybody. Yeah. Even if yeah. you didn't need it, or you call, they just gave it to everybody. So people who were making money also got CERB or SEBA or whatever they got. Yeah. What did they go do? They went to go buy cars, houses, like stocks, bonds, all this kind of stuff. But don't also forget that Ever since interest rates going up, the stock market has been getting kicked in the nuts. Yeah. So yeah. a lot of people that felt super rich in January, February, are not feeling so rich right now. Property prices mm -hmm. slid down, interest rates gone up, their portfolios are taking a bit of a kicking. So you'll find that people would automatically stop spending money. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because, all right. And then they talk about all these trips people are taking this year. I guarantee you 90% were vouchers that they had from 2020 to <laughs> yeah, 2020. That's true. And they that's needed true. to go somewhere, right? Um, yeah. And and so, of course, airfares are going because people are flying again. Like, these are all things that in 2021, they're giving that shit away because nobody was traveling. Nobody yeah. was going anywhere, yeah. right? And now things are open. People are flying. Yeah. So I think that come March of 2023, we'll find that things are a lot different than they were in March of 2022. Yeah, I think I think people also kind of have a, an interesting perspective from what I've seen where they feel like um, like oh. cash or money has some kind of value in and of itself. When in reality, money is something that you go to get goods. Goods are the ones that have value, right? And if you're printing all this cash out, simultaneously people aren't working so you're producing less and there's more money everything's just automatically going to cost more right because there's just not enough things to go around for the amount of dollars that we've just kind of sent out and so people are kind of like they thought oh my god this money's it's it's free so it's good but nothing's free <laughs> nothing is free and we're kind of understanding that now yeah and, and like i said there's a lot of people who collected serb and got yeah. loans and stuff like that and didn't really need it but they just thought hey you know what if they're giving it away, I'm going to take it. Yeah. Right. And I heard a lot of people getting their serve. And first thing they went to buy a car and right? like, okay. And then you, you run out of cars. Now car prices are going up because there is no cars. Yeah. And the, the, the supply chain issues that we had definitely didn't help inflation because people who wanted, had the money would pay more for it. But I think now with the way interest rates are, and like, if you go at least a car, I think interest rates are like eight ninety nine. Like, yeah, like people are like, I'm just going to wait now. Right, yeah. and this all cycle through the system. I think that by the time we get to like the new year, we should be back to more like the Canadian government. The Canadian economy works really well when primes around four yeah. percent, and if fixed rates are be, like low to you know mid to low threes is where we hum along. It's like you know good growth, you know interest rates are stable, inflation stable, everyone yeah. you know is going through. But the problem we're going to have here, and we can talk about this is. The governments are doing nothing to address the housing crisis that we yeah. have. Yeah. Right? The fundamental demand for real estate is quite high. It's a little dormant right now until kind of things settle out. But you get immigration back. They say that there's going to be 2 million new immigrants coming to Canada by 2030. Okay. Where are you going to house these people? Like we don't have housing. Like there's there's no there's no place to house these people. We're we're putting about two hundred to three hundred thousand new homes, um, and we need like two million. Yeah. So yeah. So as long as we're behind the eight ball here, like I understand, either stop immigration for a while until we catch up, which they'll never do. Yeah. Right. To mandate builders to say, look, if you buy land for development, you have five years to develop it and finish it, or we're gonna start charging you taxes, which they'll never do. Right. Mm -hmm. um, if they can make the bureaucracy of actually building new housing much easier, which municipalities will never do. Yeah, so I until agree. someone comes in and changes the whole system and process of how to build housing, the real estate in Canada will continue to boom 20% a year because we just don't have any. Yeah. We don't yeah. have enough. 
Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I feel like, because um, a lot of people come to me, oh my God, the housing, house, houses and the prices are like uh, tanking in, in Canada. It's not a good time to buy. I'm like, first of all, they're only tanking because people are scared and stepping back. It's not like the U.S. when, when they tank, they properly tank. We, we don't have a shortage of people working. We don't really have a shortage of money. We don't have an excess supply of housing. We have a shortage of housing. So as soon as people calm down, they're jumping right back into the market. because And you could see that because rental rates are going through the roof, right? If we had a, a weak economy, rental rates would go and be going down too. You'd have high homelessness. We don't have that. So people do have money. They're just trying to figure out is now a good time to enter the market, which means that the market's strong, but it's kind of people are sidelining. And to your point, I just feel like um, the one thing that would solve our kind of issues is if we kind of look to our neighbors down south and see how, like, their communities are built where it's, there isn't that bureaucracy. There isn't that much central planning. They don't have that as much central planning as we do here. And we have other limitations because our health care is, is universal. Um, our uh, public school system is more centralized than it is down, down south. But we need to find a creative way where that doesn't prevent zones, zonings to be changed and, and builders to come out. And we need to be able to produce an environment where 80% of the housing market is not owned by a dozen um, or new developments is not owned by a dozen builders, whereas in the States where it's like 80% of housing is by small builders who are building like two houses at a time. And so, therefore, you just get so much more into the system than you do here where everything's so controlled. Well, I, my, a good friend of mine is a general contractor. He says, like, well, we, we traveled, go down to Texas, Austin, or whatever. It takes two months to get a building permit in Austin, Texas. It takes a year. Yeah. And that's not, if I have yeah. a little committee of adjustments, it takes like 18 months in order for me to get everything done from start to finish. So, like, even yeah. these condos that they build now, they're building now, they apply for those permits probably 15, like, they started that process 15 years ago. Yeah. Right? Yeah. They don't site plan approvals, and you have to have all these studies and environmental studies, shadow studies, traffic studies, all this kind of study. And the funny thing is, it doesn't make it any easier because if you really look at where they're building condos, traffic is terrible. What the point is a traffic yeah, study to true. tell us yeah. that, you know what, you, you know what I mean? Like, it, it makes no sense. You make me do a traffic study for a 600-unit apartment building, but the traffic still sucks. So yeah. why bother? Just fill yeah. it up. Like, and, yeah. and, and I think that also they talk about affordable housing, right? So here's something for you. For every unit they build it as, as, as a condo, you have to pay like $143,000, the builder does, for a development fee for that condo, just one unit. Oh, wow. Okay? Oh, wow. And then you have land transfer tax, right? And then you have property tax. So the government really makes more money on that unit for development than the actual guy is taking the risk. Yeah. And, and we can't pass that off. Like, we have to pass off to the consumer. So if you think about... Land transfer tax and the and the development fees. If they took those away, that'll drop home price by two hundred grand. Yeah, Could that I mean, and, and yeah, and, and that incentivizes the the builders not to want to build as much either because they want the prices to go up because the fees are so high. They need a decent return on investment, like you're saying. Like there's there's a lot of considerable amount of risk to put up a a project with a hundred two hundred units, and if you're not making enough. It doesn't make sense to keep going. And hence, that's why I saw like, there's 10,000 projects that got canceled. Like 10,000 units got canceled because the cost yeah. of construction was too much. And there's no profit into it for them. And, and you know, in order for yeah. us to create a healthy housing system, right, you have to keep up with immigration. And then we don't. And the problem is governments yeah. are reactive, not proactive. Like, they should yeah. already have zoning and everything already done for the next 10 years. So they know, look, we, there's a hundred thousand people coming to this city, uh, this year, we already have the housing already starting to be built out. So that way they have places to go. And yeah. nowadays you can't, so that's why housing is so expensive in Toronto. It's probably like, it is the craziest place to buy real estate is in, 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 yeah. in, in Ontario and, and in Vancouver and Toronto. It's like crazy. But, I mean, um, if you look at like how much people are earning, 
Um, and not just, I know a lot of people are looking at dollar amounts. They'll be like, oh my God, it's more expensive in New York City. If you look at the conversion and, and San Francisco, whatever. But if you look at um, how much people are earning versus how much the house is, it's one of the most expensive places in the world. Like how much, how much Canadians are earning, how much Torontonians and Ontarians are earning versus the price of a house. If like you're earning 100000 and your average house price is like 1.7 million. I don't know how people are going to enter this market. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how future generations are going to try to buy a house. And 100,000 is a good job. I mean, people are really starting off at 50,000, 60,000. Well, I can't, I can't know how many young professionals making, you know, 120, 130, 140 grand a year, which is like great money. Like yeah. when I was 28 years old, I never made $140,000, right? Yeah. I, it was like if I made 60. And the funny thing is you look at them and they go, okay, well, I want to buy a place. I have, you know, $50,000 saved, which is, you know, half their salary after the, after tax. And then it's great savings. And what do I qualify for? I go, you qualify for a $420,000 mortgage. They're like, what am I going to buy for four ninety? Like, what am I going to mm-hmm. buy for four ninety? There's nothing here that I can buy. Now, I can't even buy a condo or a studio. Right. And like yeah. condos are like eleven, twelve hundred dollars a square foot. And so if you're a single income family trying to get in the marketplace of less than 20% down, good luck. You don't, you won't qualify yeah. for anything like anything. It's terrible. Yeah. It's terrible. And that's that. And the government yeah. should do something for those people. First time, actual first time home buyer trying to get a marketplace. They should give them a break on the mm. qualifying rate. They should allow them to get extended amortization because you want those people to getting in the market. Right, because yeah. they're young, they're professionally I mean, they can earning more money in the future. They're good, solid workers. Yeah. Like yeah. you want those people in the market, but you, and you don't want to drive them stuff. away. Because the, the other like unintended consequence, right? I mean, it's intended because everybody kind of knows the prices are too high. If you have a, a, a professional who's making one hundred fifty thousand and can't afford a house, what are they going to do? They're going to try to move out. They're going to try to find a job somewhere else because they're getting the experience. And they're like, listen, and you're going to find a brain drain in the in the city. So it's not the best thing to do if somebody who has a, a good job who's who's trying to leave, whether it's going to other parts in Canada or in another country. It's not a smart kind of uh, long-term plan for the government, not just for housing, but just for the overall state of the economy. And listen, and you think like, for example, you get these guys that are, are getting into the tech industry who are making like 50, 60 grand and starting off and they all have to work downtown. Like making 50 grand and you have to go pay twenty eight, twenty nine hundred dollars mm-hmm. a month in rent for a one bedroom. Like you can't afford that either. So it becomes mm-hmm. very, um, it becomes very difficult on where, how are you going to make this work? Like if you want inflation to get in check as well, you're going to have to do something about creating more supply. So it keeps pressure of houses at an affordable level. Or yeah. like, I know they think the stress test them because you know what? We want to make sure that people can qualify if rates go up. That's fine and dandy. But if you get a guy's 28, 29 years old, he's got 40 years to pay his mortgage. So let him have a 40 year amortization and qualify at the contract rate. Who cares? That guy'll get in, yeah. he'll find somebody, they'll move up, and that's what you want. You want people to get in the market to move up. Now you can't it's like you're already moved up. Like gotta buy a condo, it's eight hundred thousand yeah. dollars. Yep, yep. You're yeah. you're you're saving money, but you're really that money's losing value every single day. So you're just kind of further and further behind. Well they there had an article that said the, uh, for 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 the average home in Toronto, which I think it was one point three million at the time, you'd have to make two hundred and twenty seven thousand mm-hmm. dollars a year to oh, wow. qualify and it would take you 25 years to save up 20 percent of your mortgage 20 percent down for oh, your, wow. for your so like unless you have yeah. mom and dad giving you a check you gotta wait 25 you think you're ever gonna buy that you can't buy it you just can't yeah because you're always chasing the market so what, and that's the reality of it now yeah so what advice would you give and i want to kind of wrap this up with this what advice would you give First time home buyers in this market in terms of getting into the market, what kind of um, tips and tricks can you give them um, to try to enter the market or to save or whatever it is? What, w- what would be the advice? I say, first of all, that chances are you're going to need somebody to buy with. Find a good mm. friend, find a family friend or a family relative that you're close with, whatever you want to do. But you have to get in the market because if you're not getting the market, especially the next I'm going to say six months is the window, right? Then what's mm-hmm. going to happen is when there's some good news out there, people rush back to buy. But if you really want to get in with the least amount of 
of conflict. I'm going to say that by multiple offers. Find somebody you can buy with. That's the only way right now you can probably get in the market. If you're, I know people want to do it on their own. Either you have family who's going to give you a lot of money to put down as a down payment, or you find somebody to buy with. I think that mm-hmm. is a key thing to get in the market as soon as possible. Because if you think it's expensive now, wait five more years and you'll see how more difficult it will be to get into the marketplace. Yeah. No, as soon as these interest rate ease up, prices are going up. <laughs> It doesn't have to, you know what? It doesn't have to ease up as, as as soon as people are getting used to these rates. Okay. Yeah. They'll come back to the market. That's true. Right now they're not yeah. sure, right? Like, ooh, my yeah. rate last month or six months ago was one point five, but now my rate's five point five. Like, what do I do? But if you yeah. look at the cost of homes, and I put some on my, I, I I put it on social media, that the house in February is nine fifty. The same house is eight hundred now. The cost yeah. to carry that with twenty percent down even though the rates are higher, are about the same. I think it's like $30 more a month. Yeah. So if yeah. interest rates, the only thing that keeps you from going into buying a place, you shouldn't buy a place. Yeah. Because you marry the house, you date the rate. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, you got that? You marry good, the yeah. house and you date the rate. The rate that is going to come and go every five years, three years, whatever your term yeah. is, your rate change. So yeah. you marry the house, you find a place you love to be. And here's the thing that people don't realize. If you find a place, you're better off spending a little bit more for a place you want to live for longer periods of time. There is no money flipping your house every four or five years. Yeah, no, 100%. Because it costs you about a point and a half to get in with land transfer tax. And it costs you 5% to get out with real estate fees. Mm-hmm. So if you, if you find a place you can stay for a longer period of time, you're better off. And you just hold that yeah. thing for as long as you can. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think it has to increase like six to eight percent for you to start thinking about breaking even, which is not. Uh, and then there's a headache of moving around. But yeah, no, awesome. No, I really appreciate that advice. I really, I've never heard the marry the house date the rate, but I think I'm going to be remembering that for the for <laughs> for the time I can't to come. Take for that. that was my it was my girl Lizelle who came up with that one. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's, it's pretty catchy. It's good. It's good. Yeah, but you know what? Thank you for coming on on the podcast. Any final words, Roy? I say, listen, guys, real estate's always a great investment. Best time to buy real estate is always now. Not a year from now. Not five years ago was probably better. But I'm just saying that if you're serious about getting into real estate, talk to somebody. Get pre-qualified. Even if you're not sure today, make plans for the next little while. Um, so you get prepared to, to purchase something in the near future. Um, and listen, don't worry about rates. They go up and down. Just as sooner you get in the mm-hmm. market, the better yeah. off you are. That's all I got to say. Yeah, 100% agree. Thank you for coming on the podcast, Roy. If anybody, any, if any of our listeners want to contact Roy, depending on where you're listening from, either it's going to be on the, on the bottom, his contact information is going to be on the bottom or on the side. Thanks again, Roy. No problem, Harris. It was a pleasure, my friend. Thanks for having me.